Good morning. My name is Ryan Mears. I'm the Marion County Prosecutor here in Indianapolis, Indiana. And before we get started, just a reminder to everybody that the facts that are outlined in both the probable cause affidavit and the charging information are only allegations, and a person is innocent uh, until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. It's been a long week, and, and first of all, I, I think it's important to, to thank uh, a couple of people and acknowledge the efforts of uh, a number of our partners. Uh, number one, I want to thank uh, Chief Randy Taylor, Chief Chris Bailey, uh, Deputy Chief uh, Kendall Adams for all of their help uh, and support. We asked a lot of IMPD, uh, and they made sure that they had all the resources that they needed in order for us to get this case turned around very quickly and be in a position to file charges today. Uh, so I want to thank their efforts. I also want to thank the lead investigator, Detective Winter, who has probably slept a combined uh, 20 minutes over the last 96 hours. Uh, I want to thank our friends at the crime lab who uh, we asked a lot of, who had to test a ton of evidence and get a lot of stuff to us uh, in a very quick time. Uh, and, and so I'm grateful for their assistance and help. And I also want to acknowledge uh, Deputy Prosecutors Ross Anderson and Amy Jacobson for all of the work that they did to put us in a position to file these charges uh, today. Taking a look at this case, this started uh, the early morning hours on Sunday where there was a dispute in inside Raymond Child Jr.'s home. Uh, that dispute was between family members and unfortunately that dispute resulted in violence occurring where there was multiple gunshots uh, inside the residence. Uh, as a result of those gunshots, uh, five people lost their lives inside the home. Uh, Raymond Childs Jr., Kezi Childs, Eliza Childs, Rita Childs uh, passed away inside that home as a result of the gun violence that occurred inside the residence uh, and Kira Hawkins also died as a result of the gunshots that she sustained during the course of this dispute. Uh, to compound the tragedy with Ms. Hawkins, she was pregnant, uh, very pregnant at the time that this incident occurred. When officers responded to the scene, she was immediately rushed to the hospital where they made every effort to try to save uh, her baby. But unfortunately, as a result of the gunshot wounds that she sustained, uh, her baby also lost its life. There was a surviving victim in this case, and that surviving victim uh, was able to hear and see what was going on inside the residence. He heard the gunshots. Uh, he was obviously well acquainted and related to everyone inside the home. Uh, he was able to flee that residence, and as he was fleeing the residence, he too sustained multiple gunshots. Uh, the information that we have been provided uh, leads us to believe that there is a single gunman involved in this particular case. There were two different firearms that were fired at the scene. Uh, there's a nine millimeter handgun that was recovered inside the residence and as the investigation progressed they also recovered a draco firearm the evidence that we have indicates uh, and we are alleging that the person responsible for these six murders is raymond childs the third raymond childs is a 17 year old juvenile as a result of uh, getting that information being provided uh, with the information and it was alleged that Raymond Childs was responsible for this incident that occurred on Adams Street. IMPD worked very quickly and promptly to locate Mr. Childs III. They located Mr. Childs III and during the course of that uh, investigation they were able to recover the second firearm that was used in the commission of these uh, homicides. Mr. Childs, as I mentioned, is, is 17 years old, which puts us in kind of a unique procedural posture in terms of how this case is, is filed and how it will, will proceed. Uh, number one, under Indiana law, if you are 17 years of age and you are accused of murder, those charges must and have to be filed in adult court. There is no option to file in juvenile court. Uh, if an individual is less than 16 years of age, it can potentially be filed in juvenile court. Uh, but because this uh, person uh, who is alleged to have committed these offenses is 17 years of age, this case must be filed uh, in adult court. The charges that we have filed against Mr. Childs, six individual counts of murder, one count of attempted murder, and one count of carrying a handgun without a license. The range of penalty on the six counts of murder, a minimum sentence of 45 years, a maximum sentence of 65 years. On the attempt murder charge, which is a level one felony, the minimum sentence is 20 years, and there's a maximum sentence of 40 years. And on the carrying a handgun without a license, the minimum sentence is zero days in jail, up to one year. As I mentioned, uh, Mr. Childs is 17 years of age. Uh, and because he is 17 years of age, we are not permitted under Indiana law to seek the death penalty. We are not in a position to seek the death penalty due to uh, the accused's age. However, we are in a position to potentially pursue a life without parole sentence in this case 
the statutory aggravators that would allow us to potentially file a life without parole case is the fact that we have multiple victims involved in this case and that there was a pregnant woman who lost her child during the course of this incident. Those two statutory aggravators are sufficient for us to potentially file life without parole. Uh, I think it's important to note on the murder charges in Indiana that these charges, the minimum penalty of 45 years up to 65 years, all of these counts can be run consecutive to one another or they can be stacked on one another. It's also important to note that all of these charges can be run concurrent to one another. So our potential range of penalty as we address this particular uh, case is a minimum sentence of 45 years should someone be found guilty uh, up until the maximum penalty that is potentially available to this particular individual up to life without parole. Are there any questions? Um, do you know what the nature of the dispute was that set up several other times? It certainly appears that there was an argument uh, between father and son that took place in, in, inside the residence. The, the specifics of it, I, I, I don't think we have a ton of information on. Uh, certainly there is an allegation uh, about staying out too late uh, was what maybe started uh, the initial argument uh, and where it went from there. I think that's something we're still trying to piece together. Is there any indication that the suspect was under the influence of drugs? The information that we have in time doesn't indicate that, uh, but uh, we were not in a position to, to have contact with that individual until some time later. Um, so at, at this point in time, we don't have anything to suggest uh, drug use, uh, but it's certainly something that we'll explore. Can you explain the logistics of filing a charge on an unborn child? Yeah, so in, in, in Indiana law, so the, the first five counts of, of murder are your typical did knowingly kill. Uh, another person. That six count for killing the unborn child is actually a, a new addition to the Indiana Code, the Indiana statute, which now says that uh, if a person loses an unborn child during a commission of a crime, uh, that you can move forward with a with a with a murder charge. And, and so that's why it's a little bit different. I think it's worded as fetus uh, in, in the statute and in the charging information. Uh, and so the allegation in that particular case is because the mom lost her life due to the gunshot wound, and we also unfortunately lost the unborn child because of, of the gunshot wound, that allows us to file the additional murder charge uh, for, the, for the baby or the fetus. What is the relationship of Sierra Hawkins and the She uh, was engaged in a relationship with one of the individuals inside the home and was pregnant with the child. All the people were shot, you believe, with the Draco gun? No, so there's two different firearms used during the commission of this. Uh, the 9 millimeter that was found inside the home, uh, and then it certainly appears as though because the, the 9 millimeter was empty when it was located inside the residence, uh, that a second firearm was used, which was the Draco firearm. Both those guns obviously have been recovered. Both of those firearms have been recovered, and we've uh, been in a position to do analysis, and the casings at the scene uh, match with those two firearms. All right, has Mr. Charles put up any resistance or anything, or could you describe the the process in which the officers had arrested and caught him? There, uh, it, it was without incident or issue when the officers came into contact with him. Has he offered any kind of confession or statement? Well, it's really can't get into that. And, and the other issue is because he is 17, he has different procedural protections in terms of when law enforcement can talk to him and how they can talk to him and who needs to be present when those conversations occur. Uh, and unfortunately, I can't get into that. How significant would you say is the surviving brother's eyewitness account here of what happened? Well, it was definitely helpful in putting us in the, in, in the right direction in terms of who do we need to be focusing in on. I, I think it's important to recognize that this, this case is really much, really in its infancy. I mean, we've had, we've been working on this for 96 hours. We've already recovered the second firearm uh, and we're continuing to, to build this case. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I think it's important to recognize that we have a lot of things that are still outstanding that will we'll probably make this case look a little bit different than what it looks like uh, today, which is, you know, just the beginning of the criminal process. Is the surviving um, brother, is he expected to have a full recovery? We we'll certainly hope so. All right, I know you can't make any statements that would be considered prejudicial to the administration of justice, but what's going through your mind right now as a prosecutor, as a citizen of Marion County? I mean, the, the, the first thing that goes through your mind is you're just heartbroken. Uh, you know, I, not only did so many people lose their lives, but you, know, you, you think about that family and what they were in, anticipating. I mean, the, the, the baby was due in a week. Uh, you know, I've got two young kids my, myself, and when you, you think about the fact that that family was preparing for the, the birth of a, a child, that was probably going to be the best day in Ms. Hawkins' life. 
uh, and something that she'd been looking forward to and something that her entire family had been preparing for and that's taken away from them. Not only is it taken away, but you're also dealing with the loss of everybody else's life. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's horrible. Uh, and, and I think that's your initial reaction, but then from there, then it becomes, what can we do to help? What can we do to help this family? What can we do to help build a better case? And then, you know, what can we do to help IMP to make sure that we're building the best case possible? Uh, and, and that's kind of where you, your, your attention turns because you want to make a difference uh, in, in terms of not only helping that family get through this situation, but also bringing justice for the family and the community. I know you can't get into a profession or any details of that sort, but is he remorseful at all, or has he shown, I know he didn't give any um, resistance, but. Yeah, that, that, that's not really something that I, I, I can get into. Did any of the family return fire? It certainly does not appear that way. Did you find any other firearms in the house? No. The, the only firearm that was located inside the residence was the 9 millimeter handgun, and then the Draco firearm was recovered after the fact. Does the way that he killed his family members play into your prosecution? And how, and if so, how? Well, yes, it, 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 it's certainly the, the nature and circumstances you always consider uh, when you're trying to make decisions about what's the most appropriate way to, to proceed. Uh, I, I think, you know, in, in, in a situation like this, though, it's also important to remember that, that we have an obligation to, to the family and we need to have conversations with the family about what is appropriate for us to do, what are the next steps uh, in terms of that calculus, in terms of is life without parole appropriate. I mean, I think that's a conversation that you need to have with the family when they're ready to have that conversation. They've, they've been through a lot, they've had to endure a lot, and so we want to make sure that, that they're in a position to, where they've been able to, to process things to the extent that they can. To, to tell us, you know, hey, do, is, is this something you'd like to see happen or, or not? The, the circumstances uh, are beyond any of us can even comprehend, uh, and, and let alone what that family has to go through. Was he determined to execute everyone in the house? Well, I don't know, know if I can necessarily use the, the, the terms that you use there, but what, what I will tell you is that all of the residents uh, inside the home uh, end up being deceased, and the one person who was outside the, the home sustained multiple gunshot wounds, and we've charged with attempt murder. Throughout the process of this investigation, investigators find any sign of previous violence or disputes in a household or any idea of the makeup of that family and how close knit they might have been? That, that's really what we're looking into right now, and, and that's kind of what I talked about uh, er, earlier. You know, I think the, the initial thing is, number one, figuring out who did this and, and, and trying to get this case filed. I think now you're building on that, that case and that investigation. How did we get to this point? What were the facts that led up to this? Uh, so that's kind of the secondary phase of the investigation r right now and something that we're trying to figure out. Okay, but to, to scan back a little bit, uh, what was the argument about? You know, I, I think the argument initially started over a, a conversation about somebody going out or being outside the residence uh, and spending, you know, kind of sneaking out of the house. I, I think that was what initiated the, the, the dispute uh, in, inside the home, where it went from there. I think that's what we're trying to figure out. Yeah, we had heard that he'd been kicked out of the house. Is there any? I, I, I don't think I'd go that far. I mean, part of this is there's never going to be a reason to justify what happened. There, there's not anything that anybody's going to be able to say where you're going to say, well, that explains the loss of six lives. And, and so I, I think that's, that's part of the equation. The, the, the other part of it is just we've lost enough. Uh, enough families have experienced enough pain over issues that don't need to be settled with guns. And in particular, when you have people who are young, who are not mature, who are not responsible, and they have access to firearms, they see that as an easy way to resolve their disputes. And there has to be something in place uh, to, to, number one, help people resolve problems outside of that. But number two, why do we have so many guns in the hands of kids who are, who are 17 years old? Do you know where these guns came from yet? Or were they, any of them illegally possessed by the family? Yeah, so, so right now, the information would certainly indicate that those were firearms that uh, the, the family owned. Do you know when the suspect I'm sorry? Do you know when the suspect one o'clock today. Is there any um, thing the prosecutor's office is doing or can do in terms of helping the, the survivors in this case? I, I, absolutely, and, and you know I think this is going to be a true 
community effort. I mean, all of us need to rally around this individual for what they've had, had to endure. But yes, you know, there are, there are things that we can do to, to help with that assistance and that transition uh, with not only the, the physical pain, but the emotional pain and everything that they're going through in terms of making services available. Uh, but we all need to be candid. I mean, it's going to be a long road back. You, I'm sure, are aware of music videos that this suspect has made that uh, talk about using guns. There are guns in the video. Any indication that the guns used in these crimes are in those videos, or what connection, if any, will that have to this prosecution? And that's one of the many things that we're following up. Uh, it certainly appears in one of the videos that there's a, those firearms very strong was it resemblance to, to the firearms that uh, were recovered and, and are a part of this investigation. So that's one of the, the many things that, that we are following up on right now. When did you guys catch the suspect? When? Oh, I'm sorry, where? Oh, uh, he, he was at a relative's house. Right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.